Hello family, welcome back. Kevin Cosmo here. In today's episode of Health Matters, we're going to be discussing germs and viruses. For most of us, our entire lives, we've been taught that germs are out to get us. Viruses and bacteria are bad for us. They're coming to get us. And so, every day we use antibacterial soap and we wash our hands constantly and we would never think of eating food off the ground. And yet, some of the people who are most fastidious in these practices are constantly ill. Perhaps there's bigger things to worry about than germs, viruses, and bacteria. Perhaps we have the wrong idea entirely about germs. For three centuries, bacteria have been considered to be alien and awe-inspiring, even by sophisticated professors and dedicated students. Most of us still think that these tiny living beings are primarily germs and pathogens. These organisms are not only our own ancestors, but also are the basis of our life support systems. They supply our atmospheric gases, they cleanse our water supply, and in general, they ensure us a livable environment. The principles of human health and survival are simple but apparently too simple. We have managed to create so many complicated theories about human disease, human nutrition, and the unique role of germs and viruses that we are unable to see the forest through the trees. Physiologically, humans are not unique at all. We're much like all the other creatures in the world, and if not for our many lifestyle errors that we have invented ourselves, we too would have very little reason to fear germs or bacteria in the world. But to better understand this natural relationship between germs and viruses and other forms of life, we must examine the fundamental principles that govern all forms of life on Earth. The first principle is that of symbiosis, or interdependence, and that simply states that all forms of life depend on other forms of life for their own existence. And of all the forms of life on Earth, the vast majority are too small to be seen by the naked eye, and inhabit every minute space in the soil, water, and atmosphere, and are on and within all larger creatures. It was from such lowly forms of life that the higher forms evolved, and upon which today the higher forms depend completely for their continued existence. Note this, to believe in the evolution of species does not mean inherently you have to be an atheist, nor does it mean you have to fully believe every single word that was expressed by Darwin. That a higher species had evolved from more primitive ones was something that had been observed and discussed many years before Darwin came on the scene, and Darwin's theory of evolution was new only in that it presented an explanation for the observed phenomenon. He invented a theory of how it worked and called the process natural selection wherein he proposed that through entirely accidental, random changes, a permanent change occurs when it confers an advantage to that individual. Yet, it turns out to be not survival of the fittest so much as survival of the fit enough. And the part of his theory which has been disputed always is the belief that the evolutionary changes are random, occurring entirely by chance. When the complexity of a single cell is contemplated, it is inconceivable that a random chance of events in wide open spaces or for that matter, intelligently directed events in a modern laboratory, could ever have produced such an exquisitely complex thing as life forms we see. And even given a complete living cell to start off with, and unlimited time, the number of random mutations needed to produce even something as lowly or as simple, even though it's not quite simple, as an earthworm is so infinitely great that for them to occur with the necessary precision and exact sequence by sheer accident is beyond the remotest possibility. And if evolution could not occur by chance alone, there must be some guiding force. Even if that force works by trial and error, there must be some intelligent at work. Thus, we use terms like the wisdom of nature, or nature's design, or simply great spirit, God, Allah, whatever creative intelligent force name you want to give to it that allows life to exist. Now you may be wondering, what does all this talk about evolution have to do with germs and viruses and bacteria? Well, viruses are the most primitive life form that we know, and I say life form because by themselves, they are apparently inert and apparently lifeless. They require some combination with components within living cells before exhibiting any lifelike characteristics. Viruses can come in different sizes, the largest known being very much smaller than even the smallest bacteria though, which are in fact simple cells themselves. Some bacteria are aerobic, meaning requiring oxygen, and some are anaerobic, depending on whether oxygen is available to them or not, being capable of change according to the state of their immediate environment. So germs, viruses, and bacteria are the foundational elements that all other life forms are dependent upon. And again, all living things on Earth are dependent upon other living things. The entire scenario being a rather fine balance. And the upsetting of this balance in even just a little way results in the extinctions of some life forms and drastic changes in other life forms struggling to survive. Now we're getting closer to the point, which is what role do viruses and germs play in our world? All forms of life are capable in varying degrees of adapting to environmental changes. And germs and viruses have been shown to do this and have been doing this from time immemorial. So when Anton van El constructed one of the first effective optical microscopes, he was astounded at the complexity of miniature life forms that existed and teemed unseen to the naked eye. Long before higher forms of life began to appear, the world has been filled with bacteria, 
which forms the basis of all other forms of life. They manufacture soil out of rock, destroy unhealthy tissues of plants and animals, break down tissues of plants and animals to be used again, and actually form an essential part of the body and the bodily functions of all animals. Focusing on that last part about the behavior and function of bacteria normally found in a healthy body, their behavior and function and shape depend entirely upon the environment of that body. Only when the internal environment becomes deteriorated, many normal bacteria change from a benign form to a pathological form, and again, as a natural consequence. So when a person allows a pathological condition of biochemistry within their body, they should not be surprised and see what comes next as ill fate, or God punishing you, or a germ attacking you with some malicious intent. It should be seen as a natural consequence of keeping an ill state of condition within the body. Now that we're talking about this internal environment, it's time to introduce Antoine Bechamp. It's someone we should all know. His contemporary was Louis Pasteur, and they had quite a bit of debate between them, and we'll get into why they debated on this particular topic. But Bechamp made some of the greatest contributions to the science of microbiology in the 19th century, and whose many discoveries have been recorded in the annals of French Academy of Science, but which have often been erroneously accredited to Louis Pasteur. Before Bechamp's time, the theory of a cell being the basic unit of life was well established. But Bechamp's investigation showed that the cell itself was made up of smaller living entities, capable of intelligent behavior and self-reproduction. He referred to these as molecular granulations and gave them the name of microzymas. Bechamp described how in certain conditions, microzymas could develop into bacteria within a cell and could, if the right conditions persisted, become pathological, so that infection could take place in the body without the acquisition of germs from an outside source. Because other researchers had not observed the changes in form capable by various microbes, it became standard orthodox belief that each form of the same microbe at the time it was observed was an entirely different microbe in its own right, which remained always the same. Thus, at the end of the 19th century, two schools of thought existed. Pleomorphism, as propounded by Bechamp and Ernst Alquist of Sweden, and monomorphism, as propounded by Pasteur and Robert Koch of Germany. And about this time, Germany had become predominant in medical research, and with the germ theory taking hold and firmly entrenched in the minds of orthodox doctors, microbiology research took off, focusing on medical problems as the focus rather than general biology and studying how bacteria normally function within the body as well. Nevertheless, the evidence supporting the concept of pleomorphism kept appearing. In 1916, Dr. Gutner Enderlein while studying typhus, observed microscopic entities in blood samples which could move, unite with other microorganisms, and disappear. Later, with dark field microscopy, he observed that these microorganisms could change in form through a cycle of countless variations. As part of a normal process of life, these microorganisms live together within the body in a mutually beneficial relationship, symbiosis. However, he noted in his 1925 book, The Life Cycle of Bacteria, that with any deterioration of the body's internal environment, in which the pH of the blood either becomes acidic or strongly alkaline, the normally harmless microbes would begin to change and in stages evolve into forms of pathogenic nature, just as Bechamp had said. This same year, Enderlein happened to become member of the Microbiological Society of Vienna, of which he later became the president. And in Dr. Enderlein's 60 years of research, he ended up duplicating much of what Bechamp had discovered. He found that, number one, the cell does not represent the primary living unit of the body. Instead, there are tinier biological units that live within the cells. Number two, the blood is not sterile, but contains microorganisms capable of causing mischief if given the proper environment. Number three, certain microorganisms undergo an exact, scientifically verifiable growth cycle. These observations have been confirmed by numerous scientists and doctors, sometimes in even the most orthodox of settings. For example, Dr. Raymond Brown of Sloan Kettering Institute for Cancer Research says, pleomorphic organisms are demonstrable as the silent stage of a gamut of infections that include tuberculosis, syphilis, leprosy, rheumatic fever, undulant fever, typhoid, and candida. They have been repeatedly found in diseases of undetermined etiology, arthritis, cancer, multiple sclerosis, sarcoid collagen disease, Whipple's disease, Crohn's disease, and Carposi sarcoma. Now, that germs from outside the body can cause disease inside a susceptible host is not disputed. That's not something I'm disputing at all, as there are many instances of epidemics caused by just such. For example, the cholera epidemic of 1854 in London, when water supplied by one particular street pump became contaminated by a cesspool, and many people using that pump came down with cholera, while people nearby using a different supply suffered no cholera. The epidemic stopped as soon as the pump was deactivated. But note that not every person in London died. Humans are exceptionally resistant to disease. Only the susceptible ones perish. The unsusceptible ones escape. Susceptibility becomes the key. And this truth is observed and described by Dr. Arnold Fox, former assistant professor of medicine at UC Irvine. Many years ago, 
As a resident in internal medicine at LA County Hospital, I was in charge of the adult infectious disease ward. For 10 to 15 hours a day, I was exposed to just about every infectious illness you can imagine. These patients had tuberculosis, meningitis, the very deadly septicemia, and other dangerous diseases. They coughed and sneezed on me. I got their blood, sweat, and even feces on my hand, but I didn't catch any of their diseases. My doctor within kept me in perfect health. Sometime later on, I was transferred from the infectious disease ward and into surgery. Months later, I came down with meningitis, a potentially deadly infection of the covering of the brain. But I hadn't been near anyone with meningitis who could have given me the disease. What happened was that I was working double shifts, going to every class offered, and moonlighting as well. I had run my immune system down to the ground. This experience is not unique to Dr. Fox, but common to all doctors, nurses, and hospital staff. It's a wonder that the germ theory has stood up in the way it has. Susceptibility to infection ought to be the focus of those looking to prevent infection. And susceptibility is determined by the condition of the organism. Nobel laureate Dr. Otto Warburg demonstrates this succinctly when he said at a meeting of Nobel laureates, if one injects tetanus spores, which can germinate only at very low oxygen pressures into the blood of healthy mice, the mice do not sicken with tetanus because the spores find no place in the normal body where the oxygen pressure is sufficiently low. However, one injects tetanus spores into the blood of tumor bearing mice and the mice sicken with tetanus because the oxygen pressure in the tumors can be so low that the spores can germinate. Which reminds me of a story when I was 14, a squirrel jumped down from a tree as I was walking by in the, in the driveway and bit me on the arm, and yet I did not get rabies nor did I get a shot. And that was because at the time, I was not susceptible to such an infection. And as well now, I keep my body in such a condition, which is why I never catch a cold or a flu. Hopefully it's becoming clear that the real cause of infectious disease is whatever makes a person susceptible. And we know what that something is. It's the absence of homeostasis and coherent function in the body brought about by a disturbed internal environment. It is said that our body is a temple, and germs and viruses are natural inhabitants of that temple, many of which assist us in the daily operations of that temple, and others which, when the temple begins to decay, perform to more quickly complete its destruction. But whether these microorganisms behave like dangerous bits of alien invaders or inconspicuous, fantastic helpers depends on how we maintain this system, and it's entirely upon us and the environment around us that determines this internal environment the substances, forces, influences, and conditions that we subject ourselves to. Thanks for watching, family. If you want any help creating a fantastically healthy internal environment, I'm here for you. The coaching link's down below, free recipe books down below, 30 days of recipe meal plans set up for you down below. Click those links. Until the next video, live joyously, live passionately, go to health.